My read of the Shangri-La dialogue was that there are serious security concerns worldwide and they've shifted considerably over the pandemic. Um, Pre-pandemic it looked like this, now we're two years down the road and things have changed but I think what I take from the dialogue most is uh, the optimism of working together, the fact that uh, for example uh, the US and China were in the same room and we had a plenary session with them and we got to meet with so many different people for the first time in person, many of us. Okay. Uh, so there was a good optimism. But, I mean, there's Ukraine, there's South China Sea, the Pacific. What concerns you the most? Number one priority has always been the Pacific. When I announced our priorities, I said it was the Pacific. And, you know, I'm not shy to say that at the time, everyone said I got it wrong and it should be South China Sea. But obviously, it's proven that the Pacific needs to be of interest to all of us. And we've made that clear, and I made that clear to the colleagues that I met while I was in Singapore. All right, well, we'll talk more about the Pacific in a, in a moment, but is there a, an increasing pressure from our neighbours for New Zealand to increase its military spend because of the increase in geopolitical tension? No. I've had multilateral meetings, uh, bilateral, multilateral meetings over the past week. Not one person has raised the spend on defence. Because our spend is 1.5% of GDP. Correct. Similar nations, 2%, it's higher. Well, we're higher than Canada, uh, and we've come a long way since uh, the previous national government. But like I've always said... We're not as high as Australia. It's just across no, we the aren't as high as Australia, that's correct. We're also in a very different position to Australia. But I also want to be clear. In my discussions with the Deputy Prime Minister from Australia, who's their defence minister... We were quite excited about the opportunity of working together, acknowledging that they have vast more resources than we do. So we've got to be fitting with them and in sync with them. Have we run out of money? Because I noticed that a new ship project has just been put on hold by Defence. Is that the end of the cash flow? No, not at all. Um, we've made it clear with the Minister of Finance and he's made it clear to us that we will still consider every project on a project-to-project -project basis. We've just invested over $4 billion in more assets to help us with the Defence Force. That will also improve our ability to service the Pacific even more. OK. You also met with Admiral Bauer, who's the chair of the NATO Military Committee whilst you were up there. They're inviting New Zealand to the NATO Leaders Summit. Did he, did he raise the issue of the amount of defence spend? Because their benchmark is 2% of GDP. No, he didn't. Not at all. Like I said, no. nobody that I met with at the Shangri-La Dialogue mentioned anything about spending. So is NATO trying to draw us into them? Uh, no, I don't think so. But I do think that with the strategic challenges worldwide, I think it's important that whether you're in uh, the NATO or you're in, for example, uh, ASEAN or wherever it might be, that you must continue these discussions. Sort of the old, uh, I guess, multilateral setups have shifted and changed. And I think the important message I got too from... Uh, the Shangri-La dialogue was that we can't give up on multilateralism. Are you going to the NATO Leaders Summit? Is Jacinda Ardern going? Um, look, I'm not going, and you'll have to ask the Prime Minister if she's you're going. Not aware, but I, you're not aware whether she's going? Uh, well, I'm not aware right now whether or not she's going. I do understand that there's some interest in the NATO meeting, but of course we've also got the Pacific Island Forum coming up very soon, I understand, in a few weeks' time, which is of huge importance to us too. You spent an hour with the uh, Chinese Defence Minister. You said he came with an agenda. What did you mean by that? Well, everyone who goes into a meeting wants to make it clear what the priorities of our country or their, their respective countries are. Uh, and he was no different, uh, just like I was. I went in to make it clear mm -hmm. that our stance with respect to the Pacific is about independent sovereign states and our job is to partner with uh, our, our whanau, if you like, from the Pacific. What did he say to you? Uh, his, his comments, more broadly speaking, without being too specific and in detail, were about uh, the intention of... Uh, of what they've embarked on with in the Pacific and their recent visits through the Pacific. Uh, but also they wanted to make clear to me that, uh, uh, you know, they wanted to continue to work together. And Is there increasing anxiety by in China and by China about our position being drawn towards the US and Australia? Uh, look, I think that was a theme in a lot of what um, the Chinese delegation said throughout the whole uh, meeting. But... Um, and then did well, he raise that with you? It wasn't a point he laboured with me, but he did touch on it briefly. And did you push back against their sort of push into the Pacific? Oh, like I said, I made it very clear that we uh, look towards the Pacific and we, we value its security and its future prosperity and want mm. to make sure that 
we support the Pacific as an independent state and to allow them to make decisions for themselves. So what was your message to China about its recent foray into the Pacific? Oh, it was directly that, that we will, we will work with people in the Pacific that have like-minded values, that share the same values that we want for the Pacific. I mean, they're nice big broad terms. Did you say to them, we believe it could be a security uh, impact or a security threat if China moves into the Pacific like that? Look, like I said, I don't want to go into the specifics of exactly what we talked about um, because I think there was a good mutual respect there in what we shared. You know, China has signed its security deal with the Solomon Islands and now New Zealand is negotiating a maritime security work plan. Is that in direct response to the increasing Chinese influence? Not at all. I met with my Solomon Island counterpart and I said to him, what are the priorities of the Solomon Islands? And he said, maritime security. And I looked at our team and said, we can help you with that. And he said, we'd appreciate that. Would you have asked that question if China hadn't been trying to exert its influence in the Pacific? Well, I asked the same of most of the people that I met with to make sure that what we're looking towards and what they're looking towards, where it fits, we can work together. And that's very clear in our bilateral dialogue. And so what, what is the detail of this maritime security? Well, like I said, it was, I literally just asked them, um, what, five days ago or however long it was ago, within the last week. And they're quite clear that they want to do a strategy and have a very clear policy on maritime security. But what they said was they didn't feel they had the capacity or the expertise to do that. I looked at our Ministry of, De our Ministry of Defence and said, we've got a strong policy team. We should be reaching out to help, and that's exactly what we're Are you happy do. with the way that you have responded and looked after the Pacific since you've been Defence Minister? Oh, most definitely, and I've already used the Tonga uh, example. I've already been in touch with my counterparts regularly over the past two years, despite COVID. And, you know, I, I, I can appreciate some of the tensions, but I'll give the example of when I walked into the meeting with the Solomon Islands, he called me minister, and at the end of it, he called me brother and gave me a hug. So what, relations are good? Like the Prime Minister said, we don't have bilateral relationships with the Pacific, we have family relationships. After Singapore, you went to South Korea. Why is it necessary for the Defence Minister to go to South Korea? Uh, it's one of our long-standing deployments to South Korea to support the UN mission there uh, for security and peace. And I was proud to go along and see our Defence Force personnel uh, check in on them to listen to what they're doing in the first instance, but also what are some of the barriers and challenges that, as a defence minister, we might look towards helping? Is there a geopolitical similarity with South Korea? They uh, have a big US presence, they trade with China, sort of like us. Are we similar to South Korea in being that ba in caught in that balancing act? Well, when I met with two of the ministers from South Korea, they were quite clear to me that we do share similar values, we do share similar principles, and. Uh, you know, all of our meetings in my time there was actually really quite progressive. Right. Is South Korea and New Zealand being courted by NATO because they've been invited to the Leaders' Summit as well? Mm. Well, like I said, um, the NATO commander was actually quite good to me. He was very warm. We talked about some of the areas where we have worked together in the past, uh, but I don't think he's put on the charm offensive. But I think in these strategic geopolitical times, I think it's really important that we are seen to be at the table and we are part of the dialogue. The speech that you gave up there concerned uh, the New Zealand Defence Force becoming green, you know, and it is working to achieve carbon neutrality. How can that be possible? Well, it's possible because I know other nations are looking towards the same thing. In, in my plenary session that we ran, for example, Germany talked about their shift to um, hydrogen power, uh, to other things that will make their defence force far more green uh, than it is today. But we accept that in the defence space, and in particular during wartime, uh, that's a very hard target to achieve, but we need to set those targets and we need to work towards it. Have you actually, I mean, do you actually know, or have you done the calculations as to how much carbon the New Zealand Defence Force actually emits? Uh, I understand there has been a calculation done, I don't know them off the top of my head, but take for example on our bases here in New Zealand, to move away from coal-fired boil boilers is a no-brainer for us and that's the work that we're doing. And I can understand you're also trying to get, you know, electric or hybrid you know, vans and vehicles, but how do you get a green tank? Well, actually, funnily you say that, because the German um, uh, member or minister who spoke in my plenary session said they have solar-powered tanks, and they're trialling that technology. It's a sort of a hybrid version, but the point is we're all at the bottom of a mountain, and we all want to get to the top. Defence has a new project to improve its cyber defence capability. It's supposed to go to Cabinet in June. When will that be implemented? 
Well, first thing is the defence part is part of a broad government strategy towards cyber security. It's not just a defence matter, uh, but it's been worked on for some time now to develop that proposal. Uh, we'll just have to wait for the uh, whether or not Cabinet agrees when that paper comes up. Does that mean it will enable a cyber attack capability by our Defence Force? Uh, look, I don't want to get into the details of that particular plan, and especially before Cabinet hasn't agreed to it. Well, it's been worked on for several years. I mean, the public should be able to know whether we have that capability, don't you think? Well, I think it should be a matter for the all-of-government approach. As a Minister of Defence, we're quite clear that our responsibility is to make sure that the Defence Force itself, in the first instance, uh, has good cyber security plans and ability to stop cyber attacks. So, But what about so cyber attack do. capability? Is that on the table? As Minister of Defence, like I said, ours is specifically focused on making sure we're secure in the first instance. But like I said, I don't want to get ahead of whether or not Cabinet agrees to the, uh, mm. the proposed plan. Our allies have cyber attack capability, don't they? Uh, some of our allies in other countries do, yes, and uh, like I said, I've, when I spoke with a number of uh, people over at the Shangri-La Dialogue, cyber security uh, did come up as a matter that many of us are all looking towards and how we deal with it. In 2018, the Defence Policy Statement said the Defence Force needs to be able to conduct a broader range of cyber operations to respond to activities that threaten our national security. This is urgent now, isn't it? That's four years ago. Well, I mean... I think we all know that technology changes faster than we can keep up, so there's always an urgency about it. And this government has condemned Russia's cyber attack capabilities in Ukraine against civilian targets as well as military targets. Sure. So, I mean, that's an act of war. If that happens here, is that an act of war? Well, as far as we're concerned, when it's happened here, and it has happened from memory four occasions in the past, we've notified the fact that this has happened. Were they considered an act of war? Were they carried out by a state actor? Uh, look, they're a cyber attack on our national security and our national interest. It's important that we just prepare ourselves with an expectation that there's going to be more of these in the future. Right. And cyber attack capability? Will that be part of this? My friend, you're going to have to wait till Cabinet decides on the project in the coming weeks. Defence Minister Peter Henry, thank, thank you very you. much for your time. Kia ora. Well, the four state-sponsored cyber